I invite you to take the Word of God with me and turn, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 16. Matthew and uh, chapter uh, 16. We're going to begin reading here in uh, just a moment, Matthew chapter 16. Uh, I would like to begin this message by reading a statement that was made by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Uh, that you have in your hand. Uh, it's the big sheet that says Baptists. Uh, while some may not understand the statement here that we're going to read together, uh, my desire through this series is that we would all understand this statement by the time the series is over. Uh, and so let's, uh, I'm going to read it and you can follow along. And there's a lot uh, that is packed into this one statement. And so my goal is, if, you, if something sounds a little uh, strange to you, you say, well, I don't understand that uh, aspect, that hopefully uh, this series will give us an understanding. So here, here's what he says, and this was a statement about uh, Baptists, okay? Uh, here's what he said. We believe that the Baptists are the original Christians. We did not commence our existence at the Reformation, we were reformers before Luther or Calvin were born. We never came from the Church of Rome, for we were never in it. But we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. We have always existed from the very days of Christ, and our principles, sometimes veiled and forgotten like a river which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherence. Persecuted alike by Romanists and Protestants of almost every sect. Yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others. Nor, I believe, any body of Baptists ever held it to be right to put the consciences of others under the control of man. We have ever been ready to suffer as our martyology will prove, but we are not ready to accept any help from the state to prostitute the purity of the bride of Christ to any alliance with government, and we will never make the church, although the queen, the despot over the consciences of men. Now that is quite a statement. And it may be that you say, well, I really don't understand all of this uh, because there are a lot of different ideas today about church history. And the main idea that comes across today in church history, and by the way, I say that because of my awareness of today's Christian curriculums. So for example, you would have um, what is uh, put out by Abeka um, uh, with, with Pensacola Christian College. You have um, what the, uh, the Christian curriculum from that is put out by Bob Jones University. Uh, even the curriculum that we use today, ACE, all of those curriculum present church history the same way. And here's how it goes. Uh, the Catholic Church existed, and then during the Reformation, uh, the, there's uh, all the churches that we have today, the different came out of the Reformation. And so the idea today is that whether it's Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterians, that we all come from the Roman Catholic Church. And that is just not an accurate view of church history at all. Uh, and I'll show you that tonight. And in here, Charles Haddon Spurgeon in this statement when he says that we were reformers before uh, Luther or Calvin were born. Now, most of people would not understand that statement today, but that's a true statement. Uh, and so I hope that by the time we reach the end of this series that we would understand that there is never that there's there there have always been a time since the time of the apostles all the way to today where churches have held to what I would refer to as baptistic doctrine since the time of Christ till today. And even Charles Haddon Spurgeon says it, it, you may not even be able to see clearly uh, it's uh, the, our, our heritage because uh, churches who believed Baptistic doctrine were persecuted, were burned at the stake. And uh, we'll uh, learn about groups such as the Waldensians and the, the Donatists 
and the Albigensians and all those groups that lived prior to the Reformation that were generally called Anabaptists, which is where we get uh, the term, the word Baptist today. And, and really the idea of a, the word Baptist, as we are called, uh, almost we didn't even choose that name. It was chosen for us. And I, I'll go into that, but I, I wanted to begin by establishing some things if you're here in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 16, we understand the context where Jesus Christ is gaining in popularity as he's performing miracles and he's preaching and teaching. And even the people who are listening to the teaching of Jesus Christ observe that he taught as one having authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus now is with his disciples and he is asking them a question. The first question is, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And then they uh, mention a few names, but then he says to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter uh, perks up and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And based upon that uh, confession, uh, here's what Jesus says to Peter in verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want you to notice here what Jesus says. He says, I will build my church. He even adds to that that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And so Jesus started his church with his disciples. Uh, we uh, fast forward, if you go with me to the book of Acts and uh, chapter 2, you'll read in Acts chapter 2, after the day of Pentecost has come and Jesus had uh, commanded the disciples to wait for the promise of the Father. And so when uh, the day of Pentecost came, the Holy Ghost came down. And then uh, after the manifestation of the Holy Ghost, when they were speaking in tongues and people were hearing the gospel in their own language, and, and, and then Peter stands in the midst of uh, the Jews who had gathered on the day of Pentecost, and he preaches to them Jesus. And the result of that in Acts chapter 2 uh, we begin reading in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And when we read that word, that those who received the word and were baptized were added unto them. Who's the them? That's the disciples those who formed the first church with Jesus. And so the believers who were baptized now were added, and notice they continue in the apostles' doctrine. So Jesus says, I will build my church. The first believers who were converted after Jesus' ascension uh, followed and continued in the apostles' doctrine. If you turn now with me to the book of Ephesians, uh, Paul wrote an epistle to the church at Ephesus. And here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, notice with me verse, uh, let's begin reading in verse 19. So Ephesians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 19. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. When the apostle Paul says, ye are no more strangers and and foreigners. Who is he writing that to? The church at Ephesus, right? The believers who are there, who are part of the church at Ephesus. And so he says, Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built, this church, is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so Jesus Christ is the point of reference. And he said, I will build my church. And uh, based upon that confession, he is the cornerstone. But then the church was established uh, upon the doctrine of the apostles. And the first believers who were added to the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. 
when you find that Paul makes that statement to the church at Ephesus, later the Apostle Paul sends Timothy to go and to set things in order in the church at Ephesus. And then Paul writes a letter to Timothy while he is pastoring at Ephesus. And I want you to notice what he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. So if you turn there, one more reference in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. And I want to read here a lengthy portion uh, because this will have to do with the subject that we're covering here. But notice 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. Paul writes to Timothy and he says this, who is pastoring at Ephesus. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive, captive silly women laden with sins, uh, led away with diverse lusts, but ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jans and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou, who's thou? Who is Paul writing to? Timothy. What is Timothy doing? He is pastoring the church at Ephesus. And here's what Paul says, with all of this going on around you, Timothy. By the way, remember, Paul had already written to the church at Ephesus, you are built upon the foundation of the apostles. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And now he writes Timothy in the midst of doctrinal confusion and uh, uh, he says this, but verse 10, thou, Timothy, hast fully known my doctrine. Now remember, the apostle Paul is an apostle. He is the one, and by the way, we have in the New Testament today, who do we say established New Testament doctrine in the greatest scope? Paul did. The majority of the New Testament epistles are penned by the hand of Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And so we have this doctrine, and so Paul tells Timothy, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou, Timothy, as you pastor the church at Ephesus, continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So here's the scope. Jesus started the church with his disciples. After his ascension, the disciples who formed the church became apostles, and they established New Testament church doctrine, the doctrine of the apostles. When Paul writes to those churches back after he is, uh, those churches were established, he reminds them that the church itself has been established upon the foundation of the apostles. And when he writes to a pastor, he says, you need to continue, Timothy, in the doctrine that you fully know that I've taught you. Now, why is that important today? You see, today... We do have the doctrine of the apostles. And they are contained in the scriptures. And when we read what Paul says to Timothy in verse 14, he says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Notice, notice knowing of whom thou hast learned them. 
Here's what I want to encourage you tonight with. We are the product of those who have passed down doctrine from the time of the apostles till today. And we must know, in addition to that, from whom we have learned it. That is part of our heritage. So I want to approach this series on why we are Baptist by first making some preliminary points. And now don't be alarmed because you may think here that I'm apologizing for being a Baptist, and I'm not. But I do want to make those statements because I believe they're important lest I be mislabeled in this series. And there is a potential for me to actually be, be misunderstood. So, so please listen carefully. First of all, let me just say that God has used people and churches outside of the independent Baptist churches. Now, some of you may say, well, we shouldn't say that. This is not me justifying it. This is me making a statement of fact. God has used people and churches outside of the independent Baptist churches. We dare not limit God by saying something like this. God can only use independent Baptists. On the other hand, by the way, it does not mean that the differences between churches are unimportant. Consider the young preacher. You remember Apollos in Acts chapter 18? The Bible says there was a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. <laughs> And this man, the Bible says, was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. You see, God tells us that Apollos was mighty in the scriptures. However, he needed to be instructed on certain things. And so Aquila and Priscilla knew that the things that Apollos did not understand were important for him to understand. Let me make a statement here. For example, D.L. Moody is a famous evangelist who, by the way, preached the gospel. However, D.L. Moody also baptized infants. Now, I know this may not be something that, that we know, but that's just the truth. There's a famous picture of D.L. Moody, if you've seen a picture, of him uh, sprinkling an infant. Now, did God use D.L. Moody? Of course he did. Uh, but were people saved as a result of his ministry? Yes, of course. However, we may say at the very same time that he was wrong about infant baptism and that difference is important because that practice is entirely unbiblical. So don't misunderstand me. I think it's important for us to establish the fact that God has used people and churches outside of the independent Baptist movement. That's just a statement of fact. But it's not justifying it. The differences are important. Uh, the second statement I would like to make is that uh, Baptist churches are not the only churches that are preaching the gospel. Uh, you see, I can list many churches that fall today under the umbrella of Christendom that do not preach the gospel. Okay, I can list many of them. But we have to acknowledge that there are some that do. And that Baptist churches are not the only one preaching the gospel. Uh, the preaching of the gospel is not limited to the Baptists. Uh, you remember what Paul said when he wrote to the church at Philippi? He said in Philippians 1.15, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. And some also of goodwill, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. That's Paul's words. 
And, and so uh, uh, Paul, uh, he, he recognized that there were people who may not associate with them who preached the gospel, and he rejoiced in that. And so I think we can also do the same. Baptist churches are not the only churches that are preaching the gospel. And we can rejoice at the fact that there are some who are preaching the gospel who are outside of independent Baptist churches. And so while the preaching of the gospel is very important, it is not the only preaching that's important. You see, we must pursue doctrinal purity as a whole and not just in part. A Paul, who left Timothy at Ephesus to set things in order, encouraged Timothy to continue in the doctrine. He didn't say continue in the gospel. That would be one doctrine. Continue in the doctrine that he had taught him. Well, you say, well, what's the doctrine he taught? Well, we could have a good glimpse of Paul's doctrine in Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. All of those books contain the Apostles Paul, uh, uh, Paul's doctrine. And so the whole is important. And let me make a third statement. Not all churches that brandish the name Baptist hold to Baptistic doctrine or know the history of churches. Not all churches that brandish the name Baptist hold to Baptistic doctrine or know the history of churches. You see, let me say this here. The name is not as important as the doctrine itself. Amen. Holding to Baptist doctrine should be synonymous with the doctrine we find in the Scriptures. And so as we will see that one of the distinctives of being a Baptist means that we believe in the absolute authority and inerrancy of the Bible. Now, I recognize that not all churches that have the name Baptist believe in that, but they should. Now, uh, just in this area, in my research of churches in this area, very early on, even before the church started here, I came to find that we cannot identify with the majority of Baptist churches in this area. That's just a statement of fact. Some, for doctrinal reasons, they have a completely different doctrine. Others, for philosophical reasons. Uh, but, but the point is, um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, a, a strange thing to deal with because on, on the one hand, we, we, we recognize the importance of our heritage, but those who brandish the name Baptist may not hold to Baptistic doctrine. So, but by the way, there are three options here left before us. I think if we think about the Baptist series, first of all, we can ignore all of the reasons why we are called Baptists. Right? So when the church started, we said it's going to be called First State Baptist Church. Why Baptist? Why put that in there? Why not First State Church? Why put Baptist in there? And so I think that is my responsibility as a pastor to teach why that Baptist is included in that name. Uh, and so we can, e we can be ignorant of that, but I don't think that's the answer. Uh, the second option, we could forsake the name Baptist altogether because those churches that do not hold to scriptural truth, we don't want to be associated with them. And by the way, many people have done so. Many churches today say, well, let's just take away the name Baptist and be something else so that we're not as recognizable or associated with this group over here or this group over here. And so that, that's a potential. But there's a third option, and here's what I'm trying to do here, is we can seek to gain an understanding of our Baptist heritage and an appreciation for our scriptural distinctives. I opt for option number three. Let's not just be ignorant about it. Let's not forget about the name Baptist. But rather, let's understand it and appreciate the heritage that we have received. The history of churches is, I believe, very important for us to understand. And I would like to make some introductory statements connected to this series entitled, Why We Are Baptist. And then I would like to make an application for us today. 
First of all, and so the first statements here, you say, well, you seem like you're apologizing for being Baptist. I'm not, as, I'm not at all, but I'm just declaring some statements of fact, okay? That God has used uh, people outside of the Independent Baptist movement, that our other churches who are not Baptist are preaching the gospel, but not all churches that hold the name Baptist practice Baptistic doctrine. So those are just statements of facts. It's not uh, justification, it's just statements of fact. But let me tell you why we are Baptists. First of all, the heritage of Baptist churches should be first understood and it should be treasured. The heritage of Baptist churches should be understood and treasured. We must not be ashamed to associate with those who have gone before us and suffered because of the specific doctrines that we hold to as Baptists. Uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> In 2 Timothy chapter 1, again, this is the second letter that Paul writes to Timothy. And notice if you go down with me to verse 8, here's what Paul says to Timothy. He says, but we, um, sorry, that, that, I'm in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, verse 8. But thou, Timothy, but be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now notice here, Paul says, hey, Timothy, I'm in prison, I've been persecuted. Don't be ashamed to be associated with me. We're going to come, uh, become very aware that the heritage of the Baptist is a heritage of persecution. And because of that reason, I believe it is vitally for, important for us not to be ashamed of that heritage. Uh, not to walk away from that heritage and say, well, you know what, we're not going to be called a Baptist church anymore. Well, wait a minute. The name Baptist of identifies us with our heritage, but most importantly, it identifies us with the heritage of those who have suffered for the Baptistic distinctives. Like, for example, one of them is baptism, and we're going to find that throughout the centuries, parents were drowned because they refused to baptize their infants. They rejected that false doctrine and they died as a cause because of that. You see, when I say Baptistic doctrine, I'm not talking about all doctrine, the full body of doctrine. I'm talking about those doctrines that make us Baptist distinctive. We are distinctively Baptist because we are associated with a heritage of those who have died for those distinctives. Uh, he says, uh, notice in 2 Timothy 1, verse 13, or chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. In chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We think about, um, you say, well, <clears throat> how are we associated with those who've per been persecuted uh, through, and how do you know that that is our heritage? I'd like to bring your attention to the second document I gave you this evening. And this is quite a compelling one. And so uh, we know that um, uh, many different groups were persecuted throughout the centuries. We refer to uh, the years before the Reformation as the Dark Ages. If you notice here, the Diet of Spire took place uh, in 1529 on April 19th, and so uh, the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church was um, disturbed by the activity of those who were evangelizing and baptizing. And the Catholic institution decided to respond, and here is, they had this, this meeting, and here is their edict based upon this meeting. And I want you to notice here what they say because 
This is not the document of the Baptists throughout the history. This is not the document of the Anabaptists. This is the document of those who persecuted them. And notice what they write about these people. They said, whereas it is ordered and provided in common law that no man having once been baptized according to the Christian order, now that's infant baptism, shall let himself be baptized again or for the second time, nor shall he baptize any such, and especially is it forbidden in the imperial law to do such on pain of death. Whereupon we therefore at the beginning of 1528 earnestly entreated you altogether and especially as Roman emperor, supreme advocate and guardian of our holy Christian faith by our public mandate to exhort, to restrain, and to warn your subjects, relatives, and those who belong to you against the recently arisen new error and sect of Anabaptism and its capricious, seductive, and insurrectionary adherence by your command, by your learned Christian preachers from the pulpits, and otherwise also to remind them faithfully and earnestly of the law in such a case, and especially of the great punishment of God, and to, and to proceed against those who are discovered in such a vice and error, and not to be tardy therein. Now, the vice and error he's talking about is people who are getting baptized as adults after getting saved. That second baptism, right after they were baptized as infants, that's, they call that a, 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 an, an error uh, propagated by heretics. And so they say here, to the end that such evil be punished and that further nonsense and any extension thereof be prevented and warded off, notwithstanding we find daily the, that despite the cited common law and also our mandate, here it is what they say, this old sect of Anabaptism. Now, get this. This is 1529. What do they refer to? How do they refer as Anabaptism? Now, by the way, they had just said earlier this new error and sect of Anabaptists. So is it new or is it old? They're confused themselves. In one instance, they say it's new, and then they say, actually, it's the old sect of Anabaptism. Notice, condemned and forbidden many centuries ago. You see, before the Reformation. Day by day makes greater inroads and is getting the upper hand. And I say to that, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. People, although they were under persecution, were evangelizing and baptizing the new converts. Despite the persecution, praise God. They say, in order to prevent such evil and what may proceed from it, to preserve the peace and unity of the holy empire, as well as to dispel and dispute and doubt about the punishment of rebaptism. We therefore renew the previous imperial law, as well as our above named imperial mandate, that every Anabaptist and rebaptized man and woman of the age of reason shall be condemned and brought from natural life into death by fire, sword, and the like, according to the person without preceding by the inquisition of the spiritual judges, and let the same pseudo-preachers, instigators, vagabonds, and tumultuous inciters of this said vice of Anabaptism, also whoever remains in it, and those who fall a second time, let them all by no means be shown mercy, but instead be dealt with on the power of this institution and edict earnestly with punishment. So, this is not the document published by the Anabaptists. This is the Roman Catholic Empire trying to put down by threat of death any who was an Anabaptist. The Anabaptist was not the name they chose. You understand that? They didn't walk around and call themselves, hey, we're Anabaptists. No, that's what their enemies called them. That's part of our heritage. The name Baptist is not the name we chose ourselves. It's the name that the enemies called us. Kind of like 
The believers were first called Christians at Antioch, not because they chose that, but because their enemies called them Christians. It was a derogatory term. Do you know that Anabaptist was a derogatory term? And so the heritage of the Baptist churches should be understood, but it should also be treasured. You see, the heritage that we have should be treasured and is worthy of being committed to the generations to come. Uh, the heritage of the Baptist does not find its origin in the Reformation. The churches who espoused Baptistic doctrine were in existence long before the Reformation, all the way to the time of the Apostles. Do you understand today that if Paul lived in 1529, he would have been called an Anabaptist? And so the first thing is that the heritage of Baptist churches should be understood and treasured. Secondly, the doctrine we hold as Baptists is the purest form of scriptural ecclesiology. Now, I'll explain that statement, but let me make the statement again and then I'll explain it. The doctrine we hold to as Baptists is the purest form of scriptural ecclesiology. You see, in the increasing time of doctrinal confusion and doctrinal ignorance, and what I mean by confusion is because there's so many different churches out there. And when I say doctrinal ignorance is because churches are no longer teaching doctrine. Interesting to know that many churches who've historically, historically been Baptist, now that they have ceased to teach doctrine, have lost the name Baptist. They've ceased to teach doctrine. You, you, you show me a church that's still teaching Baptistic doctrine that took the name out. There's a, a, a watering down no more doctrine and there's so much confusion in the world. But to my understanding, uh, just as I grew up and you say, well, look, you grew up uh, in uh, a home, a Christian home, but a, a, a Baptist home. And so that's why you're a Baptist. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you that, uh, that that's not the case. There's a majority of, of people who I grew up with, uh, my peers, who grew up in Baptist home who are no longer Baptists. It's not a, a guarantee that you're going to be a Baptist. But I did have to ask myself the question when I was in Bible college, and you begin to ask questions, well, why, why do I use the King James Bible? Why do I believe what I believe? Why am I a Baptist? And my desire was to find out why, because I didn't know why. That's simply the truth. If you had asked me before I went to Bible college and you say, why are you a Baptist? I would have said, I don't know. But I, I can tell you now, I can say that I'm a Baptist by conviction. And I can tell you why I know I'm a Baptist. And ultimately it gets to this place that I believe that the Baptists and Baptist doctrine is the purest form of scriptural ecclesiology. And, and when we think about the Baptist distinctives, again, the Baptist distinctive is not the whole body of doctrine, but it is what makes us distinctively Baptist. In other words, they, the Baptist distinctives of those, it's, is the doctrine that separates us from other churches. And so those should be understood. Uh, it's interesting if you read, read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and then just come away with a cursory look of what, what's the emphasis. The emphasis is quite clear. Let, let me just take you through just a brief journey through the two. Go uh, back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, notice verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Let me ask you, from what doctrine? Well, from the doctrine that Paul had established and that Paul told him to continue in. No other doctrine. Uh, chapter 1, verse 10. For whoremongers, 
for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Verse 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to our exhortation, to doctrine. Uh, notice verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save, both save thyself and them that hear thee. Chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. Chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many servants as be under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. Verse 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Verse 3, And if any teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. You see, doctrine expands to more than just the gospel. You could read 1 Timothy, all throughout 2 Timothy, even read Titus to another pastor. And the emphasis is on doctrine, continue in the doctrine, make sure that you consent to wholesome words, don't teach any other doctrine. And so we have a body of truth. The doctrine we hold to as Baptists, I believe if you, if you study what, let me say this, what a Baptist church should believe... <laughs> then you will find that that is the purest form of scriptural ecclesiology. Uh, and I understand that there are churches that are not called Baptists that may be close uh, and who may say, you may look at the doctrine and say, well, that's Baptist. And what I would say to them is, well, put the name Baptist then in your name to identify yourself. And I understand that there are churches who... Uh, call themselves Baptists who don't have this doctrine. I understand that. But the question is, do we just throw away the name or do we appreciate the name and, and understand where the name comes from and, and then stand for it and, in a sense, re-educate ourselves as to why that name is important and with what it identifies us. Thirdly, the Baptist distinctives highlight the doctrinal differences, they do not have in view the complete scope of our doctrine. See, I've gone through a whole series on Bible doctrine. We talked about the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of angels, the doctrine of the church. We go through, well, I went through all the, the doctrine. Uh, and so that, that's, in a sense, the, the scope of our doctrine. But when I speak, when we speak of Baptist distinctives, it, they're the things that separate us. So, so for example, um, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church believes that Jesus is God. Do we believe that Jesus is God? Yes. But you know where our differences are? One of those is our Baptist distinctives. We believe in bapt believers' baptism only by immersion only. So we agree in some of the doctrines, but there are some who make us distinctively Baptist. Does that make sense? And so that's what it means to be a Baptist. The Baptist distinctives are those doctrinal differences that make us distinct from other groups, from other churches, from whole denominations. Uh, so what are those Baptist distinctives? And I'll just highlight those, but I'm going to deal with every single one of them and, and kind of show you through history since the time of the apostles all the way to today, that there were groups who held to those distinctives since the time of the apostles. And we're going to try to do our best, although it's hard because during the Dark Ages, many of those fled for their lives. Uh, they were massacred by the millions because of, because of these distinctives. And I, I, and I wonder if we... 
If we go back to history and we stand with the Donatists and the Waldensians and all of those groups who espouse Baptistic doctrine, and then we bring them with us to the 21st century and say, well, you know, because of the confusion today, we're kind of going to drop the name Baptist. You understand, you know, we, we, we uh, you know, just because it's, it's a different day. And so, and they say, well, what are you ashamed of? We've died for the Baptist distinctives. We've died for the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. We died for the doctrine of baptism. We've died for those. And so I say to us in the 21st century, let's not forsake our heritage, but let's treasure it. Let's associate with it. You say, what are those Baptist distinctives? Well, let me give you... It goes as an acrostic, and I'll, I'll give you the acrostic as we go, but I'll just highlight them now. Uh, we believe in believers' baptism only by immersion only. People died because of that doctrine. We believe in letter A, the absolute authority and the inerrancy of the Holy Scriptures. Letter P, we believe in the priesthood of the believer. That you don't have to come to a priest or to someone that you call Father to go to God. You go through Jesus Christ. There is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We believe in two church ordinances. We don't believe in seven sacraments. There are two church ordinances in the, in the scriptures, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We believe in the independence of the local church. So we'll talk a little bit about why we're not Southern Baptist. And, and certainly we'll, we'll go into some of the details there. Um, uh, and again, those are nuances, but what are those that associate, associate with us with our heritage? We're going to find, if you look throughout history, that there's never been a Baptistic people that merged itself with the state and imposed their religion on others. That's never happened. So we're going to talk about the independence of the local church. We're going to talk about uh, another uh, is letter S is saved church membership. <laughs> Throughout history, you'll find churches compelled people to come to church. And the moment you were baptized as an infant, you became part of the church. Well, the Baptist people says, no, it's actually you have to have a regenerate church membership. And then there's the next letter, T, and that is two church officers. We believe in uh, pastor and deacon, or elder and deacon, or um, the other word is bishop and deacon, two church offices. And so we'll talk about that. And then we believe the letter S is in separation, and there are three components to that. We believe in church and state separation. We believe in ecclesiastical separation. And we also believe in personal separation. And so we'll talk about that. Now, this is not all the doctrine that we believe. But it is the doctrine that makes us distinct as Baptists and which true churches can be identified throughout ecclesiastical history. Now, I would like to conclude by making an application and to talk about why our heritage is important. Turn with me to the book of Daniel chapter 1. And, and I'll end there. And I'll try to do this uh, rather quickly. This took a little longer than I anticipated, but let me conclude here uh, re really quickly. Uh, in, in Daniel chapter 1, if we set quickly the setting, we know that uh, the kingdom, when, after the kingdom of Israel was divided between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the northern kingdom, composed of two tribes, had 19 evil kings. At the end of the 19th king, they were taken captivity by the Assyrians. And then you have the southern kingdom, uh, Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, who also had 19 kings, but you could say that three of them were godly, the rest of them were ungodly. But at the end, uh, we find that the Babylonian empire took the southern kingdom of Israel into captivity. And what they did is we find in Daniel chapter 1, and I just would like to highlight what the Babylonians did to the children of Israel. And I want you to think here, just for a moment, come with me and think about the heritage of Daniel and what the Babylonians are trying to do. Notice Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, which part of the vessels of the house of God, 
which he carried into the hand of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and, under, and understanding, science, and such as had ability in them that stand in the king's palace, uh, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, uh, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now, among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and to Ananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, this would be a pattern back then. If an empire defeated another country, another empire, what they would do is exactly what happens in Daniel chapter 1. You say, what is that? Disconnect them from their heritage. If you follow this list, here's what they did with Daniel. Uh, and I know we use their Babylonian name, but let's use their Hebrew name. Mishael, Ananiah, and Azariah, and Daniel. Here is what they tried to do. First of all, the Babylonians removed them from their country of heritage. That's what they did, number one. Number two, the Babylonians taught them the tradition of the Chaldeans. Number three, that's verse four, verse four, the number three, the Babylonians taught them the language of the Chaldeans. Number four, the Babylonians then made them participate in new practices. And number five, the Babylonians changed their names. Now I want you to think about that. That was done purposefully, wasn't it not? By the way, Daniel purposed in his heart that he was not going to let that happen. He said, I'm not going to be disconnected from my heritage. And so here's the application for us today as we think about the heritage of the, the Baptist people. I believe we need to be connected to our heritage. And we need to treasure it. Let's not forsake it. Let's not look for something new, some new movement like that we know better than our, the heritage before us, those who have come before us. No, no, no. Let's be connected to our heritage. The name Baptist does that. Number two, we need to be taught about the history of those who held to the Baptist distinctives that we hold to today. Let's be taught that. You see, but there's a whole movement, well, let's, let's reteach history and let's reteach some things. By the way, today, as I mentioned, most Christian curriculums do not highlight people like the Waldensians and the Donatists. They do not even mention them. But they preceded the Reformation. And so what I'm saying is we have to be taught the history of those who held to Baptistic doctrine that we hold to today. Thirdly, we need to understand the Baptistic language that identifies us with our heritage. <laughs> you see, we, we reject infant baptism. Why? When uh, the first uh, Baptist distinctive, I said that we believe in believers' baptism only by immersion only. Why are all those words important? Because it connects us to our heritage. And so we have to know the language and not replace it with some new thing. Fourth, we need to continue in the practices that have been passed down by doctrinally pure churches. By the way, there's no perfect churches. But I do believe we can identify those churches that have held to the things that we hold to today as a Baptist people. And lastly, we need to keep the name that links us to our heritage. We need to keep the name that links us to our heritage. 
You see, the Babylonians knew what they were doing. And Daniel purposed that he would not let that happen. By the way, could not we connect that to God then revealing himself to Daniel and the prophecies and those things we read later in the second half of the book of Daniel? Because Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not forget his heritage. And so I would like to, for, for us to think about those statements I made at the beginning. The Baptist people are not infallible. But I, I am concerned today that there is a, a, a disconnection from our heritage. And there, there is a watery down of, of Baptist doctrine and it kind of a, an emphasis of, well, let, let's not talk about the specifics of, of our doctrine. And, and can I say, just like Paul said to Timothy, don't be ashamed of me, the Lord's prisoner. Let's not be ashamed of those who have suffered and died because of the things that we believe on today. Let's embrace that and say, instead of forsaking them, let's, let's be retaught and understand the heritage that we, we have. You see, our faith, our faith is not a contemporary experiment. It is a treasured heritage. Our faith is not a contemporary experiment. It is a treasured heritage. And so may the Lord help us to understand why we are Baptists. Let's pray.